Our Lady of Victory parents, I am so grateful to be sending my kid to school with your kids. With families, with kids who make goodness and holiness a priority. You know, when, uh, when I was growing up, and when you were growing up, man, I'll tell you what, our kids are so much better than we were. <laughs> if we disappeared somewhere, me and my friends, my parents might have reason to worry. If our kids disappear somewhere, I'm not all that worried. Thank you, Lord. When I was in sixth, seventh, eighth grade, I, my parents were great. I was raised in a good Catholic family, and yet the people I looked up to were the people I made my rock gods. I, I saw a picture recently of Slash from Guns N' Roses. I wanted to be that guy. And I can't believe it. I'm horrified looking back and seeing the picture of Slash with his hair covering his face, sitting in a corner with a, with a Jack Daniels bottle in his hand. That's who I wanted to be like? And I remember distinctly, in I think seventh grade, being in a friend's house, I had a shot of Jack Daniels in my left hand, a crayon in my right hand. I was a confused kid. My parents dragged me off to a retreat that I did not want to go on, and it changed my life. And the thing that changed my life on this retreat, it wasn't just the talks given or the points made from the stage. I don't remember what they were. It was the people in the room. The first Christians called themselves the living ones. I have a distinct memory of a guy who was probably 60 years old. He was just praying and praising God. And I saw a light and a life in his face that made me instantly realize that Slash was dead. That all the people I looked up to had no life in them. It instantly changed who I wanted to be in life. And it ruined me for the better. <laughs> you know, we're growing up in a different era now than, than people have ever lived in before. Our kids were raising. It's in a different era than people have ever lived in before. You know, I, I've been doing the work of evangelization since that conversion experience. I knew I wanted to give my life for, for the Lord and to ministry. And some people think that the work of evangelization today is very much like the world the early Christians found themselves in, and I couldn't disagree more. This is unlike any other era in history to try to raise people with faith. And, and why is that? You know, throughout all of history, people have had a sense that they should worship something. It's built into our DNA that we should worship. The Catechism of the Catholic Church teaches that, that public worship doesn't only fulfill divine law, but natural law. It's natural. It's a subset under the virtue of justice. Religiosity comes under justice. That we should look for the source of all this and return some sort of sacrifice of praise and thanks. Uh, the work I've gotten to do with filming and speaking has taken me all around the world. It's been a huge blessing. But I'll tell you what, it's, it's so striking. If you go to Rome, you see altars to their gods. You go to Hawaii, these people never talk to the Romans. There are not only churches, but altars from the ancient Hawaiians. Not only do they worship, but they worship in similar ways. This is part of our nature. So the early Christians and the work that they had to bring people into the faith... I think it was a lot easier by comparison. They're approaching a world that has this sense of innate justice, that they owe something to some source of all of this. And the first Christians just had to convince people to go from worshiping Zeus, who is a lightning bolt wielding jerk, to Jesus Christ, the God of love, from the worst news ever to the best news ever. I think it's an easy sell. Today, we have to go into the lives of young people and convince them that they should worship something at all. That they should honor anything outside of themselves. And I've had this conversation with many young people in years of working in ministry who have said, Chris, should I get confirmed just to make my parents happy? And you know what I say? Yes, you should. I mean, you don't have to have it all figured out to say, I'm going to jump into this anyway. And, and if the only thing that keeps you going is 2,000 years of wisdom that's been passed on to you today, unless you want to tell me that with all the worldly wisdom of a 13-year-old, you're going to throw all that away from passed on to you since your family came to the faith in Jesus Christ because of all that you know right now. <laughs> yeah, so this sense of having to honor what's been handed on to us, having to honor God, it's, it's gone. And in the process, see, young people aren't just forgetting God. They're forgetting themselves. They're forgetting something that's natural within them. And as we forget something outside of us, people aren't just becoming indifferent to faith. They're becoming hostile to it more and more. And you're going to see more and more of this in the years ahead. 
You know, we see little signs of it with people spray painting or, or in recent uh, times burning or, or knocking a statue over at a church. But this kind of thing is going on inside the human heart. You see, Pharaoh, who didn't want to worship anyone else, he didn't get along with the people of God because their very presence reminded him, it convicted him, that he should bow to something more than he was, or that there was something more than him. The difference between what the Jews faced in the ancient world and what we're facing now is that we live in a world where there's many pharaohs, many people in woke culture who are annoyed by our presence, by our just being, that we remind them of something within themselves that's gone wrong. They remind them that they should bow to something. We live in a world, guys, that doesn't even want to bow to our own DNA, where we could claim on a whim that, hey, I'm gender fluid now. I'm non-binary. I am whatever I want to be. A world of self-deification. And this world's been strengthened by, by people losing themselves in media. I don't think woke culture, I don't think cancel culture came out of nowhere. We, we live in a world where we're training young people to form relationships with people online where they can cancel anyone just by deleting them. This is how they interact. So naturally, if you say something that challenges my view of reality, my limited view of reality, where I've made myself God, all, all I can do is cancel you. And, and it's not a big deal to cancel you and to shut you down. This is how they interact with people. And, and, and to, to show how, how much they're losing themselves in their, in their media-insulated world, there was a study done recently showed that the Amer average American teenager spends seven hours a, a day on screens. Seven hours a day, and that's not including their homework. There was another, another study done that showed just how distractedly they look at things online. That They're not diving into any particular topics or coming into contact with truth. They're be being separated from truth. So the average person, the average college student, they track them on their laptops to find out what their eyes were doing and how often they, they switched screens. Every 19 seconds, they switched what they were looking at. They're literally tweaking out on data. We're raising a generation of people that's lost a sense of God, that's lost a sense of obligation to what's been handed on to them, that's deifying themselves, and that's insulating themselves from reality in a world of screens. G.K. Chesterton, he said, men today have lost their way. But this is not surprising, for men have always lost their way. The difference is that now they've lost their address. <laughs> Okay, that's funny, but it's also tragic because it's so very real. They've lost their address. They've lost their very longing. Some people have asked me, don't you see the longing that young people have for God? And, and, you know, I don't see that. What I see is souls that have, have lost themselves in deep sleep. They've forgotten that they want anything more because they're so contented with their distracted life. They're souls that have lost contact with God because they've lost contact with, with reality. Hmm. You know, Jesus asked his first followers, and his first words he spoke in the Gospel of John, he saw two men following him and he said, what are you looking for? What are you looking for? I think you ask that question to the soul of a young person today, most of them will say, I don't know. I've forgotten what I'm looking for. I've forgotten. Enter our Lady of Victory. <laughs> Guys, the task of Our Lady of Victory is not just to, to bring young people into relationship with facts. And here's something I see in, in my own kid right now, and I'm so grateful to the people working there. It's not just to, to, to open them up to a world of knowledge where they learn different facts. It's to open their souls to a relationship to reality. If young people have forgotten God, it's because we live in an era where we're forgetting everything outside of our own heads. An era of self-deified people living surrounded by screens has forgotten God because we've forgotten reality. And when we call people to truth, beauty, and goodness, and you hear these words repeated again and again, guys, that's just calling people to reality. Truth is reality as it hits the intellect. Beauty is reality as it hits the heart. Goodness is reality as it appeals to the will. This is what OLV is doing. It's opening our young people up to reality. 
And as they come into contact with reality, you know what, you know what happens? They start to come into contact with their own souls again. Because they see, what am I made to search for? What am I here to find? Ah, truth, beauty, and goodness. So when the Lord asks them in their heart of hearts, what are you looking for? They know the answer. See, because at the end of the day, truth, beauty, and goodness are the fingerprints of God on creation. What do you look for? What are you seeking? What are you looking for? And the answer is, we're looking for you, Lord. <laughs> Guys, Our Lady of Victory is raising up young people who are in touch with reality, young people who are alive, who are living ones. And why is this so essential? Just so that our kids can behave well? So that unlike us when we were young people, we don't have to worry about you know, what they're doing with their friends because it'll probably be good. <laughs> you know? No, guys, it's not just that. We're raising young people who are in touch with reality because we have a world filled with people who have forgotten their way. And in the words of Pope Benedict XVI, the ultimate apologetic, the ultimate answer to people's questions about the faith is beauty and saints. The mission of Our Lady of Victory is not just to raise up good students, but to raise up saints people whose hearts are captured by love of Jesus Christ so that when other young people walk past our kids, they see what I saw walking past that 60-year-old guy at that conference who wasn't cool, who had nothing in common with Slash from Guns N' Roses. But he was alive. May God give our people, our, our kids, the grace to become fully alive. So when the world walks past them, they remember something within themselves that they've lost. <laughs> Guys, that's why I, I, I live in a climate that's cold. That's why I live in a climate where it, it snowed on September 9th, and I'm not going to move to Florida, though I can move anywhere I want with my job. That's why I travel uh, a half hour to an hour to, to, to drop my kid off at school every day. <laughs> It's because nothing, I mean, I've been all around the country, there is nothing that compares with what these kids are getting at Our Lady of Victory. And that's why I'm supporting this school. Join me in doing that. Even more than you do by paying tuition. Join me. God bless you.